Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is indeed Spiros Kouvelis. I'm the former Deputy Foreign Minister of Greece. Um, with a lot of interest and involvement in the energy discussion, especially the renewable energy discussion. I have been uh, asked very kindly by the Hellenic Energy Regulation Institute to chair this first session, and I would like to thank the organizers for this honor. Thank you very much, Andoni. Um, and I would like to invite uh, the uh, three speakers to take their places with me up here, if you don't mind. So I would like to invite Ms. Lena Sandberg, Mr. Alexandros Sairis and Mr. Athanasios Dagumas to take their seats up here with me. While the speakers are coming up, let me just tell you two things. Um, the first was that um, this week we had the pleasure and I had the honor to moderate that discussion to organize an event with uh, the Embassy of Morocco and the Embassy of France and the Ministry of Environment and Energy in Greece regarding the transition from the COP21 of the climate change in Paris last year to the COP22 uh, in Marrakesh this year um, about the climate change uh, and the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Now, in this discussion, it became very, very obvious that uh, if and when the uh, um, the commitments of the countries that has now become a legal commitment to implement what they have agreed in Paris take place, that will mean a quite significant change in the way the world has and, and will probably be creating the energy that it needs. And this is what we'll be speaking about, the future of coal and lignite in the EU after the Paris Agreement, in the sense that in all this change that will take place, we need to start to understand what are the next days bringing to us, um, what are the opportunities and what are the risks in this, um, in this development, and of course, how we can expect the energy uh, landscape to develop more in the sense of how we can have better and clean energy and more adapted to the Paris Agreement rather than what specifically will happen with fossil fuels, as in the sense of what would happen with the trade, with the horse trading after the steam engines were in, um, in practice. So I would like with these few words to uh, thank you again and invite to the podium Ms. Lena Sandberg, who will speak to us about coal after the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think I will open the floor um, with respect to the position of coal, both in Europe and worldwide, a chapter which has not been discussed so much. I would say in the last decade, we've been very busy discussing the position of renewables, whereas both coal, oil and gas, um, gas a little bit more because it was the crown jewel of the fossil fuels, but coal has not been taken a very large position, apart from the fact that we all have pretty much agreed that it's very polluting and that we want to get rid of it. The Paris Agreement, um, the Conference of the Parties, that's why it's referred to as COP, many people actually don't know that, um, of the UN Framework for Climate Change, met between 30th November and 13th December. The Paris Agreement was reached on the 12th December 2015, and it was entered into by 195 countries. It is the most ambitious climate deal we've reached worldwide today, and that in and of itself is an, is an achievement. The document lays out a long list of climate initiatives, and one of them is, of course, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and mostly from coal, coal oil, and gas. In this context, coal actually plays a very special role. Coal-fired electricity is responsible for about 40% of the worldwide energy production and 70% of its steel production. That's quite an amount. It employs hundreds and hundreds of millions of people around the world, and it's also available in abundance. Estimate, uh, analysts have estimated that we have about more than hundreds and hundreds of years of coal reserves left in the ground, and that's even measured at the current consumption level. It's also the cheapest fuel among the fossil fuels, largely because of its abundance, which have led to oversupply and therefore a reduction in price. So both its abundance, price and employment rate makes it a fuel which is hard to give up just yet. And yet, of course, it poses vast amount of problems. The ash present in coal is responsible for about 50 billion of the cost worldwide. And coal also contaminates water, and last but not least, it is responsible for tons and tons of dangerous greenhouse gas emissions, which are pumped into the air. Among the fossil fuels, it is the largest culprit of uh, greenhouse gas, gas emissions. So it is necessary to have a worldwide common denominator for reducing greenhouse gases, and particularly for coal. 
The Paris Agreement is also the first agreement which actually made developing countries require them also to reduce their greenhouse uh, gas emissions, so not just to developed countries, and that's quite an achievement. This also implies that countries like China and India, which are among the largest culprits in terms of relying on, on coal, are also parties to this agreement, and we should expect um, a, a reduction in their growth trajectory. <coughs> The agreement finally we reached was that we should keep global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius and make best efforts to keep the global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Just to put these targets into perspective, the pledges that had been made by countries prior to the agreement would have meant that global warming would have been kept to around 2.7 degrees Celsius, so almost one degree more. Again, we have a very important agreement, so if we can just implement it, we will go somewhere. Overall, the Paris Agreement means for the European countries that we should reduce our greenhouse gas emissions with more than 25%. Again, coal has a very special role in, this, in these reductions. Scientific studies have found that 88% of, of the world coal's reserves should remain under the ground if we should keep the global warming below 2 degrees Celsius. 88%. That's almost all of it. So it's clear if we should go even near or meeting 1.5 degrees Celsius, we should do even more. We should not just close the coal mines, but take more decisive action. So let's have a look at what is the situation worldwide in terms of coal. Now, 1.1 billion, and that's probably just a low estimate, of developing countries don't have access to affordable electricity, not even clean cooking facilities. So for example, India, Indonesia, Thailand, and Vietnam the chief of concern for them is to deliver this affordable electricity rather than focusing on the environment and other concerns. These countries are now industrializing, they're urbanizing, etc. So reaching this level of affordable electricity is for them a higher target. Also, China, while they have beat world records in terms of installing wind and solar power, they are still heavily reliable on coal. Coal, therefore, still has a very important role in the world's energy mix. Of course, also Australia, Malaysia, and other, uh, and other uh, Asiatic countries have followed suit with this and are also reliable on coal. If you look at the EU, the picture is a little bit more complex. While the EU has set very, I would say, ambitious targets of reducing greenhouse gas emissions with 40% by 2030 and an energy efficiency target of about 27%, in the EU, coal actually received a boost lately. Um, five, seven years ago in, in the US, uh, shale gas was being developed at a very rapid rate. Uh, US actually went from being heavily reliable on coal to become almost self-sufficient. Now they are self-sufficient in gas. That has meant they had vast coal reserves left over, which they have exported to Europe. And Europe, being flooded with all this cheap coal, uh, found itself uh, seeing that the coal price was even further reduced, making it the cheapest fossil fuel again, outcompeting gas, which was the crown jewel of the fossil fuels, and many gas plants actually had to close. Europe uh, relies for um, almost a fifth on coal coming from the US. So, coal has a place also in Europe. The ETS system didn't function as it should. We're still hoping that can be repaired. Many countries are now trying with their CO2 taxes to repair the picture. But it's clear that the renewables are still not mature to take the place of coal. Another reason that coal may last a little bit, a little while yet, is that we have, as Philip was also pointing out, we have a very sustained effort of uh, subsidizing renewables. Conventional power producers have found themselves squeezed for the past decade, and particularly in Germany, which is among the biggest country in the EU, in terms of also of energy supply, have found themselves seeing all their gas plants closing. And that has put them uh, in a hard position where they had to make ends meet in terms of the energy equity, um, because uh, energy consumption kept growing and they had to find a way to meet that. And the renewables are still very intermittent. Sometimes the sun doesn't shine, sometimes the wind doesn't blow. And therefore, you had to find <clears throat> another way of finding a conventional reliable source that you could rely on. What did we do? 
Well, we engaged in capacity mechanisms, which essentially means giving a lot of state aid for what? Well, for building new gas-fired power plants, those that have just closed. So we've entered into a little bit of a vicious circle of first giving state aid to renewable. I'm not saying I have a better solution just yet, but I'm just pointing out that we are in a bit of a paradox. And now we grant state aid to the gas-fired power plants in order to have them start again so that member states can be self-reliable because we just haven't yet received the internal market where we can uh, be interconnected with other countries and receive the necessary power from other member states. In the context of seeing where coal has its place in Europe, it's also important to make a distinction between coal production, which is essentially the extraction from mines, and the coal-fired power plants, which is combusting the coal. While we have a very strong policy now of closing these coal mines, many of these coal-fired power plants, which can perfectly well function on the basis of imports, are still in place. If you look, for example, at Germany, they alone have more than 70 coal-fired power plants still in place. And because of the scaling out of nuclear, there are even some latest construction projects constructing new coal-fired power plants. Poland alone has 50. And a small country like the Czech Republic also has 50. It's the size of one-third of Poland. Clearly, of course, Germany is the biggest one. Um, and while it is closing the two coal mines it has, um, I think it's by 2018, the, the coal-fired power plants can still rely on imported coal, which it does. Its companies have now found out that coal may have a, a, a discussable future and therefore split up uh, their conventional power production and renewable power production in order to prepare it for worse times. But the coal plants are still running. Poland has done nothing to change its coal production. The coal mines are still functioning very happy. And sometimes the, they're not even using them because they import coal because it's cheaper. So their coal-fired power plants are running either on the imported coal or on what they're extracting. The Czech Republic is a net exporter of coal. It also imports coal, but has remained its position as a net exporter of coal, meaning that a lot of the European other countries are taking from the Czech Republic. The only country I have found <laughs> which have dear con conditions for coal is actually the UK. Coal have had probably the hardest time in the UK. They've closed all their mining activities in 2015 and have issued a statement that if coal plants, coal-fired power plants, do not have in place carbon capture and storage, that is to say the facilities for reducing uh, the greenhouse gas emission, by 2025 they would also have to close. Also, the UK have introduced the carbon tax uh, based on what they co uh, call a carbon price floor, which effectively means that they raised the carbon price. And I think it was last year the price even doubled. So it has not been an easy year for, um, for coal in the UK. And if other countries were to take the same measures, coal would probably have the same position in their countries too. But that, we all know, is a political game, so that is not just about to happen. So what can we learn from all of this? Although coal extraction, as I said, is about to cease, the coal-fired power plants in many countries are still running, so, and based on imported coals, so the coal, I would say, have still a very strong position in Europe. Until 2010, actually, the EU also had a very generous uh, support scheme for coal mines. In fact, what we thought until 2010 was that we needed the coal mines uh, for reasons of security of supply. We didn't want to become dependent on countries such as Russia, so we had this massive support scheme in place. It only expired in 2010, by which time we found out that many of these coal mines were entirely uncompetitive, and now we're granting aid for closing the coal mines. I think that the overall lesson what we can take from this is that I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that coal is um, the highest culprit in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and that we all would like to see it exit. But we are not there just yet. We still have not phased in properly renewables. Renewables are only 16% of the EU supply. So we're still far from reaching that target. So 
perhaps rather than being in such a hurry to close all the coal mines or the coal-fired power plants straight away, perhaps we should spend a little bit more of our efforts, or stronger efforts, I should say, on carbon capture and storage or the other new technologies that have come around for coal, which is HeLa, which is high efficiency, low emissions. It's essentially in a technology whereby you extract more energy out of one unit of coal. And by having a higher efficiency of the extraction of energy, you uh, at the same time reduce emissions. And that technology is being developed as we speak and have actually also been implemented in some of the, the developing countries. So maybe if we would spend a little bit more resources on research in those areas, we could keep coal around more clean until the time where we are in a proper transition mode to more renewables um, and uh, gas, which is run on a commercial basis, not state subsidized. In terms of carbon capture and storage, I just thought I would end up with that because that had, um, at least I was part of that group um, about five, seven years ago. It had a very, very big future. A lot of companies were interested in investing in it. We had flagship uh, projects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was a lot of hype. However, unfortunately, with the very large cost, it's about 60 to 100 percent of, of running a conventional power plant double up to invest in carbon capture and storage companies have simply with the crisis and so forth not been able to continue their investments in carbon capture and storage and I've seen most of the European projects, that is to say the EU projects, close down. Norway is now the only one that has two or three projects still going um, and of course we all know that that is why the, the reason it is that it has a lot of um, backbone resources to invest in these kinds of technologies. But we all know that as we speak, China is interested in investing in these kinds of technologies. And I think with the resources that we have available in Europe, we should think more about investing in those kinds of technologies than merely setting a policy target of just closing down coal. That was what I had to say today. If you have any questions, I'm here for later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sandberg, for this very interesting presentation. The um, overall look on the uh, European situation and the introduction of the discussion for some uh, new or less new technologies about coping with the situation with uh, coal. Um, I would like now to invite Mr. Alexandros Saris, who will speak to us about the transparency mechanism as the backbone of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. I understand you will speak from the panel. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. My name is Alexandros Soris and my task for this morning is to speak about what is considered as the main innovation that the Paris Agreement has introduced, which is its implementation techniques, and particularly the Enkane's Transparency Framework for Action and Support, established by Article 13. This mechanism, the first of its kind in global uh, environmental governments, is the embodiment of the approach followed since the launching of the ADP in 2011, according to which emission targets which is, would be set domestically and measuring, reporting and verification, MRV, would be organized at the international level. It is of course not the only technique, as the agreement also contemplates many others. For analytical purposes, I will make a distinction between information-based techniques, facilitative techniques and the management of non-compliance. I will start with the information-based techniques. The Paris Agreement provides for three techniques that can be understood as information-based in that they not rely on information, but their very purpose is to provide information clarity in the short or the long term. Aside from the important emphasis already presented in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change placed on education, the Paris Agreement introduces two novelties, which are interconnected. The first, provided for in Article 13, relies on public pressure, perhaps a form of, shaming, of naming and shaming, to nudge states into taking, a, to taking action not only in connection with mitigation and adaptation, but also with, report to, with, report, with respect to assistance. The second, contemplated in Article 14, takes the form of global stock take which is less geared toward compliance and more towards the overall effectiveness of the climate change regime. Article 13 establishes an international mechanism on, of measuring, reporting and verification of the action support of individual states. 
This mechanism can be characterized by a reference to its nature, purpose, the information it is expected to gather, and the way in which it will process it. The, per the perceived intrusiveness of the international MRV mechanism led to strong resistance, particularly from China and India, who have resisted such an approach since the negotiations that failed to reach uh, a Copenhagen Protocol. Unsurprisingly, in Paris, this question remained open until the very end. The working draft of the agreement circulated on the last Friday of COP21 still contain its corresponding provision, three options for paragraph one. The underpinning tension related to the, extents, to the extent of differentiation in connection with transparency. The final wording is, is a compromis among these options. Reference to the robust and unified character of the mechanism, as well as rigid differentiation between developed and developing countries were left out. The agreed paragraph one applies to all countries but it stresses the inherently flexible nature and the need to account for parties' different capacities. The nature of the mechanism is further characterized in paragraphs 2 and 3, which refers to the need of developing countries and less developed countries and stresses the fact that the mechanism is to be implemented in a facilitative, non-intrusive, non-punitive manner, respectful of national sovereignty and avoid placing undue burden on parties. The purposes of the mechanism are aligned with their focus on action and support. On action, the mechanisms aid the tracking progress on parties' individual progress in achieving their NDCs under Article 4, and on parties' progress on adaptation uh, uh, under Article 7, hence excluding Article 8, action under Article 8. On support, the mechanisms aim to provide clarity as support provided and received by individual parties under a range of headings, namely mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology transfer and capacity building. The absence of loss and damage in this enumeration is conspicuous. Transparency on both action and support is to feed the global stock date contemplated in Article 14 of the agreement. As a rule, Communications by parties must be made no less frequently than on a biennial basis. The information to be communicated is, is organized according to the type of the party, of party. Importantly, all parties are to provide information on mitigation. They shall do so under Article 7. And adaptation actions, they should do so under Article 7, Paragraph 8. In addition, developed country parties shall and other parties that provide support, for example, China should report on financial, technology transfer and capacity building assistance given to developing countries parties. The latter should provide information on the support received under these headings. Again, the headings defined by reference to their specific provision, hence excluding loss and damage in article claim from the picture. Part of the information thus reported is to be subject to a technical expert review, characterizing the decision. This is another area where there was disagreement until the very end. Two options remain open. The first one envisioned a more comprehensive review, leading to the publication of a report highlighting areas of improve for improvement and even compliance, and to be discussed by the CMP. The second option introduced a rigid distinction between the review of information for developed countries, a robust technical review process with conclusions on compliance, and from developing countries, a more diluted review process taking into account the level of support received by the relevant developing country. Article 13, paragraphs 11 and 12, provides for a middle ground where implementation and achievement are indeed assessed, but in the light of the flexibility and differentiation built in in Article 13. Further modalities and procedures are to be developed by the APA under, spe under certain specified parameters. As noted above, the idea of a global stock date has, has less to do with compliance and more with effectiveness. At COP21 states, and frankly everyone, were very concerned by the fact that the INDCs, as far announced, although they cover most of the greenhouse gas emissions and emitters, still fall short of the 2 degrees Celsius target. For the climate change regime to be effective, 
a focus on the trees through the transparency mechanisms should be should not displace the more important overall overview of the forest, the overall stock of greenhouse gases in the troposphere, as well as the ability of states to cope with the impact of climate change. The global stock data inventions in Article 14 addresses this question. This global stock data is to take place periodically under modalities still to be identified by the APA. The APA has also been entrusted with the task for ide of identifying the relevant sources of information to generate this global stock date. Paragraph 100 of the decision mentions some of them, including communications from the parties on the and the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but the list is not exhaustive. This raises a quality control question, which has already been faced by the IPCC in the, con in the context of bitter accusations of bias and unreliability. unreliability sorry. Article 14 provides for what can be called an information loop in that, as I mentioned earlier, the communications from the parties inform the global stock state and in turn the latter is to inform the level of ambition to be displayed in the future NDCs by parties, Article 14, Paragraph 3. The system highlights not only the importance of the science and policy interface, most notably between the APCC and the Paris Agreement, but also the need for environmental agreements to have internal scientific bodies capable of processing scientific information in a way that, in the way that meets the needs of policy instrument. A key debate during the negotiation was the one relating to the financial system. This assistance is identified as one of the three goals of the Paris Agreement, and that obligations of assistance are subject to a sophisticated transparency mechanism established under Article 13. But who should pay? The nature of the funds, public or private, and among the latter those specifically leveraged through public intervention, their specific allocation, and the amount to be mobilized were also extreme, extremely important issues. Starting with the latter, Article 9 does not refer to any specific figure, but Paragraph 54 of the decision introduces two clarifications, namely that a new collective quantified goal will be set by the CMP prior to 2025, and that the floor will be the figure already present in previous negotiation of 100 million billion US dollars per year. Moving to who should pay, the agreement clearly bestows the obligation on developed country parties, noting that, the, that other parties are encouraged to provide such assistance. Funds may, may and will come from both public and private sources, but Article 9, paragraphs 3 and 7 emphasize public funds and private funds mobilized through public intervention. The allocation of funds is to follow three parameters, namely a balance between mitigation and adaptation, spatial consideration for more vulnerable states, including by the operating entities of the financial mechanisms, such as the World Bank and regional development banks, and used by receivers in both mitigation and adaptation. The second technique is the facilitative techniques introduced by uh, the COP21. Two more innovative mechanisms are included in Article 5 and 6 of the agreement. The first has received great attention over the last years and concerned reduced emission, not from afforestation or reforestation, but from avoided deforestation or enhancement. The so-called Red Plus has now received an anchor in a treaty provision. The details of its operation, and specifically the very important question of finance, are addressed in paragraph 55 of the decision which recognizes the importance of adequate and predictable financial resources, including for result-based payments, and encourages support from public and private bilateral and multilateral sources, such as Green Climate Fund and alternative sources in accordance with relevant decisions by the, reference of, by the Conference of the Parties. The other innovative mechanism relates to the so-called linking of domestic mitigation policies. Normally, a linking process consists of recognizing the emission reduction units from a domestic international emission trading system in another system. 
These caps, the caps are thus enlarged and the efficiency gains increased. In addition, Article 6, Paragraph 2 is formulated in a sufficiently broad manner so as to allow for linking of different types of domestic mitigation policies. Such international transfer, such international transfer mitigation outcomes are, recognized, are a recognized approach to comply with NDCs if performed in accordance with the guidelines still to be adopted by the meeting of the parts of the agreement. The final mechanism is the, manage is the management of non-compliance. The final component to be noted concerns situation where the information available suggests that Despite the many means to facilitate compliance contemplated in the agreement, a state party finds itself in a situation of non-compliance. In international environmental law, many treaties, starting with the 1987 Montreal Protocol on Substances that deplete the ozone layer, have established, have established non-adversarial mechanisms to manage situations of non-compliance. The Kyoto Protocol itself has such a mechanism. Established under Article 18, and soon to face its ultimate test in connection with compliance with state's scientific quantified obligation under Kyoto's first commitment period. The Paris Agreement provides for the, for the establishment of a non-compliance mechanism managed by a committee consisting of 12 experts elected by the CMP in accordance with some, with some distributional parameters. The operational rules and modalities governing the committee's activities will be developed by the APA and adopted by the CMP. Last but not least, Article 24 of the agreement refers to the dispute settlement clause in Article 14 of the UN, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change as applicable mutandis mutandis to the agreement. This clause, which opens the possibility for states to accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice or of an arbitral tribunal, has never been used. In addition, as already noted, paragraph 52 of the decision excludes the use of Article 8, loss and damage, as a basis for liability or compensation. I would like to uh, conclude my uh, presentation with the following lines. When I was an undergraduate student, I had a professor that used to say that one can influence behavior through, th through three fundamental levers of human action, namely coercion, interest, and virtue. Coercion, translated in the present context, context as command and control regulation, is part of the toolkit of any state, and it will continue to feature in climate change regulations through a variety of measures, such as construction and efficiency standards for mitigation or zoning requirements for adaptation. Coercion is clear, but, non, but not, not necessarily efficient, as efficiency gains arising from trading are not permitted, and sometimes not even effective, as compliance sometimes requires knowledge and resources without which systems, however coercive, will not be effective. Interest has become a major approach in regulatory intervention. Setting rules that create the desired economic incentives in regulated entities is a subtle and important art that has been embodied in a variety of mechanisms, from emission trading systems to taxes internalizing negative externalities, for example carbon dioxide emissions, to subsidies compensating for relative positive externalities, for example renewable energy. Virtue virtual relation education, understanding and civic commitment. An action that entails negative consequences for the environment is expected not to be performed however profitable if such consequences are understood. Perhaps more realistically, virtual education is expected to provide a more solid political basis for political movements that pay due regard to environmental protection. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Sarisa. Um, I think we all realize how uh, complicated the agreement, the Paris Agreement is and how complicated the implementation will also be. Uh, I expect that this will also be part of the discussion later on uh, in the context of today's uh, forum. But now I would like to invite Mr. Athanasios Dagoumas, who will speak to us for the future of coal, for hedging and energy security in a low carbon economy. Uh, he's already on the podium and uh, I would like to ask the organizer if there is a pointer that he can use for his presentation. Thank you. 
Uh, hello, thanks uh, for the introduction. I'm based at the University of Piraeus, uh, um, assistant professor in energy economics. I will speak about the fuel of coal in this uh, transition to, the, to a low carbon economy. The outline of the presentation uh, will be firstly to, to put a framework of the energy and climate policy, mainly for the EU, and to identify if there is a role within this framework for coal, and then to see if uh, there are enough price signals for the coal to be in the market. And I will present some uh, first preliminary results from a modeling work that we are doing at the University of Piraeus. Let's go to the first part. If you go on the website of the European Union, you will see 10 priorities. Maybe the most important is the TTIP agreement, but one of the most important also is the European the Energy Union. And if you see the Energy Union, practically it's three bullets. It says that we want secure, affordable, and cl climate-friendly energy. And I was wondering where is the coal within this framework. This is what we'll try to identify. Let's see it step by step. Why we want secure energy? Secure energy practically means that we want uninterrupted supply of energy at affordable prices. What we really need from security is to avoid energy crisis. So it means that we are vulnerable to energy crisis. And why we want to avoid energy crisis is because we have an experience from the 70s where because of the oil crisis there was a stagnation in the market. And over the last years there is a conflict between Russia and Ukraine concerning the disruption of supply. supply. And this is more obvious if you see this map showing with red lines the flow of gas from Russia to Europe that comes mainly from Ukraine. So this is the first pillar that requires major investments and critical infrastructure. Second, why affordable energy? Affordable energy because Europe means competition and, and requires cheap energy. And uh, somebody will say, why do we need an internal market? Where European Union and the U European Union means, an, means a market, energy is a commodity, so somebody should expect that there is already a market. Yes, that's correct. But the issue is that gas and electricity are green bound, so it requires an infrastructure in order to have the market. So if you don't have an infrastructure, there is no market. So, in order to do this, the European Commission has realized it and this has identified the project of common interest as the main financial tool in order to determine which are the most important projects to facilitate this market and critical infrastructure. And this will cover about 5.4 billion euros. This project of human, uh, common interest are uh, depicted in this picture with uh, red is the gas, with blue, blue is the electricity, where it shows that there is a major problem of internal market in Southeast Europe and in the Baltic states, and uh, there is a problem for electrical connection mainly in the islands, in the UK and the Scandinavia. If this happens, then we'll go to, to a practical internal market, which means that we go from the national market to a pan-European market but this will happen through regional markets. And the last bullet for this framework is the climate friendly and the energy. It's already discussed, I will not say more. All, Europe already has the 2020, 2030, 2050 targets and now the Paris Agreement. So it's a clear vision. Europe wants to be a climate global leader, so there is no way to depict, to depart from this way. So for this framework, Europe has identified many of those bullets to move on, which is the diversification of resources and the routes, the enhancement of indigenous resources, and mainly the renewables, financing energy networks, and energy efficiency. And this will lead to energy cost reduction, which is the main reason behind that, because it has a competition problem from the states because of the shale oil and the shale gas. Uh, revolution over there. So, within this framework, secure, climate-friendly and affordable energy, what is the role for coal? 
for hedging, somebody will say that we need it because it can provide affordable energy in critical periods. For energy security, there is a role, especially there is again a problem for supply of gas from the Russia or, or other areas. And for climate authority, there is no role unless there is a progress, progress on the carbon capture and storage. For this low carbon economy vision, what is clear and secure for the future is that the only energy carrier that has a role is the renewables. And this is, the, is clear because the levelized cost of energy is reduced so rapidly and it will continue. And especially if it is linked with a major progress in the storage, there is no clear role for other energy carriers besides the renewables. So coal cannot compete renewables. Has a clear uh, opposite, uh, vital, uh, which is the conventional energy, so nuclear and gas. So the issue is who is the cheapest between them. But it operates in a market where already exists an overcapacity, and this will continue in the future. And overcapacity means that it will go towards a zero marginal cost economy. And this does not happen only in energy. It happens in all markets, in all economies where exist a lot of stock. For example, the houses, a lot of stock, and then the Airbnb puts the, the prices for uh, the homes and the hotels. The same happens in the cars, a lot of stock for cars, and then the Uber takes this chance and creates and pushes the prices. This is the same framework that is happening in energy, and the results are clear. Uh, and is, uh, you can see that for the utilities over the last year, 2015, there were huge losses, about 8 billion euros for some of the major energy utilities in Europe. So this is the framework where coal has to find a role, and it's not very user friendly. And now I'm going to show what we are doing at the University of Piraeus. We have created, we have already a model for the Greek uh, energy market and we have extended for the borders and now we have a, a first version, that's why I will present preliminary results for a European market. This is a classical minimization, optimization problem to minimize the overall energy system cost. It, it combines the long-term energy planning with a unit commitment, so it shows which capacity will be added and what will be the price in the market. And it's generic, so it's applicable for both electricity and the gas markets. The main advantage of such models is that they identify the bottlenecks between the different systems and different prices, and they identify the price zones and the power mix. I will not go in detail. This is the objective function. I know it's a low conference, but all the details are there. It's a cost. Import cost, export, storage, reserves, a lot of technical constraints of the units, of the resources, a lot of security constraints, which is depending on the national or regional policy maker, energy security, technology penetration issues, and a lot of environmental constraints, which again depending on the renewable penetration targets, targets or emission reduction targets. So this is the model that we are using. And we define what is well known in the energy experts, the system, the power mix and the system margin applies is for each zonal, for each zone in Europe. And we combine it with A and energy visual neural networks in order to have a robust forecast, energy demand forecast for the future. So, um, just two figures and I'm done. This is a graph showing the coal share in the power mix in Europe, which has been decreased from 50% to less than 30, it's about 25% now in Europe. This is the current situation. And we have estimated, this is global, this is aggregate figures for Europe, is that the share is less than 5%. We made the Monte Carlo analysis, and you can see this graph, it's almost a Gaussian graph, 
and it's about 3 to 4 percent for most scenarios. It can be zero for several scenarios and it can go more than 10 percent in some scenarios in about 20 years from now. So the market shows practically very little share for coal. So the market is not very friendly for the coal, but we have to see if the coal has a role there. Well, there is a role for the coal, and this role concerns only extreme events, which is, for example, a six-month disruption of gas from Russia, where, again, from, from the model, we don't show that uh, the investments in coal are profitable. There is no sense for that. It's, it's very clear for a very deep emission reduction targets. But some assets in coal are very useful in order to, do, to have it for hedging in those critical periods and also to be in, in better position to negotiate your contracts, especially if they are long-term contracts, gas-linked or oil-linked. So there is some role, but for a small, very small share of coal units. And I'm in the conclusions. What I have said in this presentation is that the European Union has a clear vision for an energy union for secure, climate-friendly and affordable energy. For this route, it has identified these major steps. Major, mainly it's investments in infrastructure, a lot of renewables, a lot of energy efficiency in order to, cre to create a liquid energy market. And it, it, it will do it mainly through the project of common interest. So for the coal, there is no clear role in the market. However, although the sales from market-based solution is less than 5%, we identify that there is a, a, a good role for coal, for some companies to have it in their assets, because they have the capability to hedge the risk in critical periods, and then they are in good position to negotiate uh, contracts. But this is for very small share of coal units. And finally, and I'm done, I just want to mention that we have established an energy laboratory, an energy policy laboratory at the University of Piraeus, and the next month it will be online. I'm happy to visit our website. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Mr. Dagumas, Dr. Dagumas, about this very interesting presentation. I'm sure that the conclusions show very clearly what under political consideration, of course, is the future for coal or could be the future in Europe. I'm sure that with your mathematics, you scared everybody in the room, uh, but <laughs> the conclusions actually made up for this. Um, I'm afraid that there will not be any time for questions because we're already running late, but I would like to invite you on behalf of the organizers for a coffee break in which you will have the chance to address your questions directly to the speakers, whom I would all like to thank for your great presentations. Thank you very much.